Hello, everyone, and welcome to Davenant Discussions. My name is Ben Miller, and I'm here today with Dr. Brad Littlejohn, who is the president of the Davenant Trust. And in this series of videos, we are going to be um, setting forth uh, the four core ideas or pillars, if you like, of Davenant's work and mission. And we've selected four keywords to express those four pillars, reason, retrieval, engagement, and essentials. And in this video, we're going to take the first of those, which is reason. Now, human reason is a pretty big, imposing concept. And when you hear Christians talk about reason, on one hand, they, they obviously see the importance of it. Um, there's a lot of market for worldview curriculum. Um, we want to be thinking Christians. We need to be thinking Christians. But on the other hand, there is often concern that too much emphasis on human reason can become intellectualistic. It can become a kind of rationalist approach to the Bible that can actually corrupt the simplicity of our faith in God and our faith in His Word, um, can even distract us from the Bible. Um, when you say speak of reason um, in Davenant's mission, what, what do you have in mind by human reason, and why is it so integral to, to Davenant's work? Yeah, well, I think it's important that we distinguish clearly between a kind of modern Enlightenment-inflected concept of reason and what the, the Christian humanists of old would have meant by reason. And when, of course, when we say humanist in this context, uh, the Protestant reformers would consider themselves humanists, which they, would, which they meant students of human nature, not, not the sense of humanist in which reality is determined by human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really actually gets to the core of, I think, what's different about their concept of reason. When I, when I teach philosophy to undergrads, the first class, I always say, the, the core question I want you to be asking yourself throughout this course is, to what extent is our knowledge a recognition of an order given in reality hmm. versus to what extent is our knowledge an imposition of order by the human mind on reality? And, and I think uh, C.S. Lewis actually frames the issue of, of modernity versus pre-modernity in Abolition of Man very, very similarly to that. So I, I think when we talk about reason then, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attunement of the soul to the order given in reality, and it's a recognition that the God who made our minds is the same as the God who made the world around us. And so, we should expect that reality to be knowable, and we should dedicate ourselves to being attentive to, to the order that, that, he, that He has established. So you mentioned um, an Enlightenment view of reason and a Christian humanist view of reason, and, and cited the Reformers as an example of the latter. So are there particular historical models that you would point to of how this more Christian approach to reason and its appropriation of the world has been um, developed and, and deployed? Yeah, well, I think the Reformation is really a, a shining example of this. Uh, it, it is a, it's a Reformation, it's a retrieval and a reform of the Gospel first and foremost, but uh, all of the great Protestant reformers also saw it as a, as a reform of educational curricula. And in their training for pastors, it wasn't just biblical study, it was biblical study uh, um, and studied biblical languages, but the, the theologian had to be a student of logic, of metaphysics, mm -hmm. of, of law, of, uh, of, of ethics, of, of natural philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, all the, he had to have his, his, his feet firmly grounded in in the order of the natural world, uh, if he was going to talk about how grace restored nature. And I think what has increasingly happened is we've, uh, you know, what we're now stuck with is, is Christians are always trying to, we're stuck with a the theology as a kind of this free-floating discourse about spiritual things, and we're always exhorting ourselves, we need, to, we need to apply theology back to the real world. And so we've got this divorce that we're trying to overcome. but. Why, why did we accept this divorce in the first place? Is it important that the God who inspired the scriptures also created the world? These are both his ways of communicating. Yeah, exactly, us. exactly. It doesn't need to be, it's not reason versus revelation, right? It's, it's, it's God, has, God reveals himself in the things that he has made. We recognize his attributes there, illuminated further by his word. There is going to be a worry, though, um, that because the Bible is our is God's primary revelation to us. And that, that's sort of a, a basic Christian idea, it seems, that the primary way in which God reveals himself and, and, and reveals his truth to us and reveals a perspective about reality, um, describes reality to us, is in the Bible. So isn't too much emphasis on 
reason and its appropriation of reality may be independent of the Bible, isn't that in some way saying that the Bible maybe isn't really primary or maybe isn't sufficient in what it says about reality? Well, I think it's important uh, that, that we, we make distinctions about what we mean when we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture. I mean, anyone, no matter how strongly they emphasize that you know, the, the Bible gives us guidance for all of life, which is, which is true, no matter how strongly emphasize that, anyone's going to recognize that, say, the Bible doesn't teach us a great deal about astronomy or about the physiology of, of earthworms. Okay, I mean that just that just goes without saying. There are there's a knowledge of uh, the natural world that we are called upon to to cultivate, um, that we glorify God by cultivating, that is not revealed to us, or it may be it may be referred to briefly in Scripture, but there's there's not much in Scripture. That's not now, what the Bible's for, right? And now, of course, the more we move into human affairs, mm. and particularly the moral dimensions of human affairs. The more, um, the more that our, our the lenses of our reason are clouded by sin, and the more the scripture is necessary to 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 clarify our vision. Um, so it, it's not an either or, but it is a question of of what what are we talking about, and and do we want to apply the same kind of um, same concept of biblical authority and biblical sufficiency to every area of knowledge. And also when we study the Bible itself, aren't we using reason? Exactly. I mean, if you're getting, I mean, anyone who's done serious exegesis knows you've got to apply your reason to the grammatical analysis of the words, to comparing this passage to that passage, looking at the historical context. That's all application of reasoning tools to, to reap the fruit of Scripture. One final question related to this. Obviously, a lot of Christian parents would be concerned. You know, they've heard the stories of kids going off to college, studying philosophy, and leaving the faith. How might you encourage parents to help their children while they're maybe still at home, both to love the scriptures and to also love the uh, you know proper employment of human reason, Christian reason? Yeah, you know, I think the problem there is we shouldn't accept um, philosophy as it is commonly taught in the modern university mm -hmm. as normative for what philosophy can be and, and is. I think it is true that it is very hostile to the faith as it is often taught now. But I would argue that a lot of what goes for philosophy now is... is Every bit as corrupt as much what goes for theology now, and we need to recover a better vision of of philosophy from the days when philosophy was understood as a handmaiden of theology, along with recovering a, a fuller understanding of the scriptures and and the, the heritage of our our theological forebears. That's very helpful. Thank you very much.